Oh, uh, man. Tyka's actually, I don't know if you noticed, Tyka is in Coffee Town. When uh, Glenn Howerton is getting his hair cut at the school in the early scene, Tyka is the uh, guy, is the, the store or whatever, the the teacher. Don't be afraid to, don't be afraid to fail. <laughs> Wait, oh my yeah. God, I didn't even notice that, <laughs> yeah. man. Like, That's awesome. That's Tyka, he was on set with me. I'm like, come play this guy. <laughs> just jump in there. He's like, it was, it was funny because it was like, oh, I don't have a visa. I'm like, yeah, who cares? This is just a stupid movie. Just get in there. <laughs> Speaking of uh, people you know being in Coffee Town, I noticed when I did the rewatch last night for the show, uh, Oliver Copeland, the boy. Yeah. That's your, is that your son? That's my son. Yep. He was, they, you know, they, uh, they told me he was such a sweet, he's 12 now and grumpy and weird as that happens. But the, uh, uh, he's a great kid. But back then they're like, kids this young have a real time like not looking at the camera and stuff like that and i'm like trust me he's got it and he was perfect he was, he was good. yeah that's that's awesome yeah um well that's a perfect segue so yeah we're in 2013 coffee town i discovered coffee town because i'm a huge uh always sunny fan and um just 10 episodes every 365 days is not nearly enough time uh, f for Glenn Howerton to be in my life. So I was I was desperate to find something else that he was in, and that led me to Coffee Town. And I swear within five, the first five minutes of the movie, I didn't care if, if Glenn Howerton died. And it was he was no longer in it. It was just such a – all the characters in it are so great. Um perfectly nuanced characters the writings fresh and quirky i mean the jokes are like it's like a joke every 30 you seconds can't keep up. it's you insane can't keep up. um and every joke is fresh and quirky and you get it, that like what i love about coffee town is that you don't there there's a lot of times where like the the joke about aids uh that that comes back like it's not just a joke for a joke about aids he uses that as a device to get the next roommate out and mm -hmm. then kind of like the jokes surrounding um down syndrome that comes where well, you oh, know at, full at the robbery full circle. uh all, all the way to the 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 one of the most hilarious moments when he's when he lets people in the, when will lets people in the uh in the door before him and they cut him in line and he makes the choice later <laughs> on to, to to not put up with that shit anymore and ends up getting shot. So like the jokes aren't even just just rapid fire jokes for the sake of being funny. They come back again and Call pay that. off. Um, so it's just so excellently written. It reminded me of of Office Space, the way you can you have like a a finger so on such unique nuances about different people that mm -hmm. like we all know in some way, and that's what's so funny about it. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I could just keep going. So where where uh -huh. did the... I know you said that that was kind of like a, a hodgepodge of different things that you were thinking of and, and just, you know, put in put like a Frankenstein of uh, ideas that you've had throughout the years. But, um, like, wh how did you flesh that out? Like, where did the idea in general come from? Um, it was like a decade of, yeah, little ideas that had been, you know, the, the concept existed from the moment I saw people on their laptops in <clears throat> Starbucks. Of like, oh, I want to tell that story. So then when you have the concept in your head, I just start gathering pieces year after year and kind of writing them down in a little spiral notebook. Like for instance, the holding the door open happened. Uh, it, was actually, it was actually Ashton Kutcher. I was at a Starbucks here in Sherman Oaks and I opened the door. Uh, so Ashton was behind me and I opened the door. I'm like, hey man, and I don't know him or whatever. And he just like, he's like, oh, thanks. And he like walked in. I was just being nice. And then he got in line. I'm like, I was clearly ahead of you and I opened the line for you, dude. Like you should be letting me in line ahead of you. It was just like, so that I went home and I wrote that down. You know, it's like all those little things kept adding into it. Uh, so yeah, I just started collecting all these ideas and all these concepts. And then I just wrote the script. I just wrote it really fast. And I, it was the easiest front side of a project I've ever had. I gave it to my agent who was getting on a plane um, to New York. And I said, I just wrote this thing to direct. It's really small. It's a couple million dollars. And he got off the plane. He called me and he said, it's great. I gave it to Ricky Van Veen at collegehumor.com and Ricky wants to make it. They're just, they'll just fund it. You don't have to go anywhere else. You're done. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, I was literally thinking I was going to get, uh, you know, he was going to catch some grammar mistakes and we were going to rewrite it for, you know, a month and go back and forth. And then we'd go out to the town. It was just all done. And I literally, so that script was greenlit with literally a ton of spelling errors and off the very first draft. So 
yeah. And, it, and then we just went and there was, the cast just came together really naturally. Um, the first guy I met for the lead was actually Chris O'Dowd. Uh, and then like, he was right, but not perfect. And, and I think there were some scheduling issues. And then we heard that Glenn was interested. So I sat down with Glenn and I'm like, this is just perfect. It's, he's the perfect guy. I always wanted Steve Little for Chad uh from my eastbound and down days of just like uh he's just so funny and i i and still to this day i feel he is so underused he's so funny and it's like he should be everywhere and he really isn't he just kind of just works and does his thing um and then ben ben was for uh ben we read uh schwartz we read for the barista and he's like <clears throat> i don't want to play the barista like, i don't, not he's like i don't want to be the guy it's like i want to be the cop i'm like what like the cop was going to be Damon Wayans Jr. and hit Damon Wayans had read for it and wanted to do it. Uh, and he Ben just wanted it so bad. And I was like, well, if he wants it that bad, let's just do it. Like, and uh, so Ben became the cop. And then uh, Josh Groban reached out to be the barista. And I was like, what? Like Josh Groban, he's a singer. And they're like, well, you just, will you just meet with him? And uh, I'm like, yeah, of course, I'm Josh Groban. Who wouldn't want to like go have coffee with Josh Groban? How fun is that? And he was just the sweetest, sweetest guy in the world. And he, he was so honest. He's like, I want to do this. I'll read, like I'll, I'll, I'll audition. And I'm like, what? All right. And so him and he, we went to uh, the uh, Sunny in Philadelphia offices and he read with Glenn. We did like a little chemistry read and we knew instantly, uh, even Glenn knew. He's like, this is great. Like this guy, this, like it's going to be such a great interplay. Um, so yeah, it all just came together really organically. And then we just went off and then all the other little pieces, there's people in there like Jake Johnson and Matt Walsh plays a cop at the end. There's just people in there that are like became all these, there were just all the comedy people I loved. Uh, and they were just, it was crazy. They were just willing to do it, like, which is still astonishing to this day. <laughs> I'm like, really? Jake that's Johnson what, is willing to come out and play this part? That's what we were going to ask. We were, me and him were discussing this the other day. We were like, each character, like you said, sometimes it's a perfect mesh of where the, the script meets the characters and then everybody buys in. So what we, me and him were wondering, did you write with specific people in mind or did it just kind of organically happen? Or did you have the best casting director ever? Because, I mean, these guys, you see it on screen. I, I think it's a, little, it's a mixture of both. You know, we had a great casting director, Jewel Beskup, who did a bunch. Of, she did The Hangover. She did Wedding Crashes and stuff like that. And she did life pieces with me. Um, but uh, there were there were people that that just came out of the woodwork through the agency. I think what what was really happening was the script was kind of catching fire, and people really liked the idea, and they liked the idea of it being this little indie cool movie. And our timing was perfect because those kind of movies were getting just starting to get looked at uh, for online streaming and iTunes and stuff like that. So yeah, it really truly was a combination of both. Josh Groban was Jules. She's the one that brought it up. Um, Annie Pilecki, Adrian Pilecki was casting. Like they said, she'd be perfect for this. And I'm like, if she's willing to do it, that's great. I love her. She's in Friday Night Lights and she's the best, you know? So yeah, it was, it was truly a combination of both those things. That, that's one of the things I really like about this movie is most comedies in this vein, the the female in it is usually just there as more like a glorified prop, pretty mm -hmm. much. They don't really have, but she actually she had funny lines and right. and really funny moments. Uh, I thought that was that was that was cool. I mean, she doesn't want guys yeah. to know piss comes out of her. Let's just make that very clear. Let's make that very clear. <laughs> she was actually it's it, the. Uh, Allison Williams was, so I look at your shirt. Mr. and Mrs. Williams is based off of uh, Ricky Van Veen was the producer who found a college tumor. He was married at the time or getting married to Allison Williams, Brian Williams' daughter. Mm -hmm. um, so Allison was on or getting ready to go on Lena Dunham's show on HBO, whatever, whatever that was it called, Girls, I think. Um, Allison was, if, if Annie Plecky couldn't do it, uh, Allison was going to be it. But that's why that's what Mr. and Mrs. Williams came from. It's based on Ricky and Alice Williams. Oh, very nice. Um, I knew I was in something special when, like, I think it's like 90 seconds into the movie, you have Jake Johnson running in. I have f***ing AIDS. I'm like, all right, this is a comedy, right? Because, And then it actually <laughs> successfully, like, has humor coexist with AIDS and I never thought that was a possibility and then Derek Waters uh, character with the sleep condition comes shortly after the uh, <laughs> this. Um, and, and then 
like, uh, where did these, like, I know you, you had the, it seems like a lot of them come from a somewhat personal experience. Um, oh my God, the, uh, you can't get it twice. Like, <laughs> oh, that was it for me. That was like, it. That was it. There's so many great moments that are so pointed. Like, where did, where did these ideas come from? You know, they just, they came from my head. <laughs> I think they just came from my <laughs> twisted sensibility. Some of those jokes, we had a little round table. I think that you can't get it twice came from Jimmy Vallely, who is one of the greatest writers that is in this town. Like he's probably 55, 60 now. Um, he was a writer with me on Arrested Development, but he's been, he was like a Golden Girls writer. He's been around forever. I think he pitched that joke in a little round table we had. When my, uh, when my wife and I were watching it last night, she, that part came on again. She said, oh my God, I forgot about that. That is literally the most disgusting uh, thing ever. And I was, I was like, that's AIDS, was, that's AIDS phobic. AIDS, it, you know what, what Coffee Town kind of was, was when you're a sitcom writer, you say things in the room that are darker and funnier than could ever be on TV, you know? Um, and that's just it. I mean, I think it's that way just when you're sitting around with your friends joking and laughing, you're like, oh my God, we, no one can say what, what we just said or whatever. And Coffee Town was kind of my, my platform of saying, let's just do all those jokes. Let's like, let's have a, a fight between a Down syndrome guy. Let's have, uh, you know, the, the, the gay rant thing, which was, I think I wouldn't even do today back then. Like, I think I would probably cringe if I watched that again. Uh, but, uh, so there were things that were so on the edge that I think they expired, frankly. I think that they, were, they probably crossed the line. I could literally <laughs> feel myself turning black on the inside. <laughs> oh, that is just... <laughs> I don't think that would land. That would be a really hard thing to do right now. That would be a hard joke because everything's so, you know, uh, you know how it is. It's just really hard to, no one wants to take the risk of that kind of thing going viral. But Coffee Town existed in the last moment before things went viral. So we got right. to do all those things. Um, but that's also, I think, one of the reasons that you don't see Coffee Town on Netflix and things like that. I think they watch right. it and they're like, whoa, no way. <laughs> so. Yeah, and there's it's such a loss, too, because there's something so much more gratifying about a joke that you that you feel like you shouldn't laugh at compared to a safe joke. It's right. like you could feel a pressure valve being released when something like that happens. And, man, there is so much pressure built up now that we could use that pressure yeah. relief, and people I are just afraid to... Like how do we? How do you say something racist without sounding racist? Like, There's no way to do that. There's no way to do that. Uh, what I was gonna say, the, the genre I came up with it. I call it respectfully dark. And like I say, I still love to see stuff like that because again, I feel like comedians are have been stripped of being comedians nowadays. They can no longer be themselves, which completely sucks. But let me ask you this: uh, We both have directed before, and we talked about it clearly the crescendo to you, your career. Now you direct Coffee Town, and like you say, it's like a I guess it's a writer's dream. Because again, you you're in the room with all these writers, but now everyone's looking at you. So you can't just write, you can't just edit, you can't just put. You're wearing all these hats. What was that experience like? It's 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 fun. It's really uh, it's it's a weird thing. There's so much pressure, and but you're so it takes so much effort to direct, as you guys know. There's so many things happening at once that you don't have time to freak out. You just have to go into the mode. I, I think like the best director advice I ever give is just like make a decision, even if it might be wrong. And then later say, Oh yeah, I was wrong. Like that's better than being indecisive in the moment. So there was a lot of that where I'm like, I have no idea, but I'm going to tell you the answer to the question. Like I know I'm right. And uh, so it, it's like, you don't have time to feel it till almost till afterwards. I think when we were wrapped in and editing, it's just like, Oh, then it's a relief of like, Jesus. Um, but coffee town was, made in 24 days that is a short amount of time for a big yeah. movie like that and we had a, a small budget i think it came out to like 2.3 million or something but that's i mean we built a coffee store and stuff like so automatically you've lost 500,000 of that right off the bat just to build the the coffee wow. town. coffee town was just like a studs you know it was just nothing so to build that and to set design it and to decorate it it's like then you you know you put in the the money we were paying the cast and all that like all now you're down to just like seven hundred thousand dollars so it's like it goes quick um so what what ended up happening was we had like two or three takes for each thing so we couldn't re we had to just fly we had to fly um so there was a lot of that and it, it, it was a whirlwind 
Wow, that is the opposite of my assumption when I watch it because it, everything feels so organic, like especially all the dialogue in Coffee Town when the three guys are just kind of it seems like it, when I it seems like when I watch it I'm like they they had to have just a lot of time to play with these moments and and figure out, you know, just try different things, but they know there's three takes. That's that's great. Yeah. That kind of answers my question. I mean, with there's so many um, hilarious mini stories happening within this movie from Ben Schwartz's misadventures as the worst cop ever, uh, the, the the feud between Josh Groban's character and Glenn Howerton's character is just amazing. The little nuance about the the, the him not wanting to take the tip um, makes me feel like a whore. Steve, that, that, I, my, I think my favorite part is uh, Steve Little's character where he ends up taking up smoking to get that's actually how i started smoking cigarettes when i was 18 i was working at hollywood video and i noticed that i only got a 30 minute break but the people that smoked got to step out whenever they needed it and i was like <laughs> all right I I'm, I'm gonna and i actually started smoking newports and black and milds around that time so that yeah. hit chad's character really we weren't friends me. back then we weren't friends back then uh, <laughs> um, real but, quick question let, let me side note i just have to know whose idea was it to give the bomb the tall boy with the roofies i have to know who idea that was say that again? whose idea was it to give the bomb the tall boy of beer with roofies in it oh my god I don't even remember. <laughs> I, that, that just took me out. I'm just telling you that, right? Like, so it's okay. We're, like, like you say, respectfully dark. He'll be okay. We just want to sleep for a little while. Just take some roofies and a beer. Here you go. <laughs> and it wasn't enough to hand it to him voluntarily. When he to I, 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 I'm trying to think back. I think there was also like certain rules. Like we we could do roofies, but we couldn't do other things, like to put him to sleep and stuff. Just, oh like, <laughs> so that's why they knock it out his hand when it actually happens. Like he he, he knocks it out his own hand. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, and it's all it's all faint in my memory, but there were definitely rules. Like, yeah, definitely you could show it going down. There still are. I mean, like it's it's there were so many rules that snuck up on us. Yeah. So, was, were there any like any of the moments that we see on screen or any character developments? Was any of that spawned by just so many hilarious people being together on set? Yeah, I, I every every take was between takes. People would come up with little things. Like like Ben Schwartz came up to me in the first couple of days. And he said, I'm never going to eat anything, but I'm always going to have a muffin in my hand. I'm always going to be smelling it or tasting it. <laughs> but I mean, you're never, so he did. So every time he he's, he's like, right. yeah, he's like sniffing it, but he never eats. He never eats anything. And that's like his quirk. Um, and we came up with all of that stuff. It, you know, it was just fun. And it was, uh, a lot of it was just goofing around between takes because it did take time to set up the shots, obviously. Uh, and then you, it was just magic. And you could tell the, the guys were all friends. There was also like a weird thing where like a lot of them are pretty rich. Like, like Josh Groban has a ton of money. Glenn Howard has a ton of money. There was like this kind of like, Hey, you know, like let's, it was almost like a camp thing. Like no one reason I mentioned that, like no one was really out there to make a living. It was more like a bunch of friends making a college film just for the sheer joy of it. Uh, and I think that that's what you see coming through is everyone kind of discovering these fun little things they got to do. And those guys are all still friends. Like they're all, all of us are, but like Ben and, and Groban and uh, Howerton and all those guys are all super tight now from that. I think it really paid off too, because like if you ever stand outside a comedy club, you have like, they are always trying to one up each other. And like with most comedies, you have the funny guy, and then everybody else throwing him softballs to hit. And with yeah. this, you have so many funny people on the set. It's like they're sharpening each other every day. Mm -hmm. And you could tell on the screen. Like, they are, yeah, like, I can't, I, we are going to pick a favorite character in this episode. Yes, we are. But <laughs> it is really, really difficult to. I can't, I, like, even the, even the people that have a second, like, the guy that comes in and starts singing happy birthday behind them. Like, uh, get out of here. Get you, out of here. You know better than that. Like, everybody shines. Yeah. By the way, that's, that's Josh singing. When he actually hits the big note, that's Josh Groban singing. We dubbed wow. it. See, see, I got to go back and watch that part again. I <laughs> yeah, I like, ah, whatever. I'm like, that's, actually, that's Josh. And, Mike, and then we put it in the guy's mouth. Because the funny thing is, we told Josh, we're like, you're in this movie, but you're going to sing terribly, which he does. Except the one moment where it's someone else singing, then it's your voice. <laughs> <laughs> that is insane. Uh, one of the things that I think we've been spoiled with in film nowadays, especially with Marvel, uh, Easter eggs. Like, there's like 
30, 40 Easter eggs. People are looking for things of that nature. Now, of course, we found a, uh, an Easter egg in Coffee Town. Of course, there was a mention and a reference to, of course, Life in, life in Pieces. Flip what? that. Life in Pieces reference Coffee Town. I'm sorry. You know what I mean. I'm sorry. Okay. Hey, listen. What's in that water? Yeah, yeah. So, the, the, yes, yes. So, Life in Pieces, uh, of course, reference Coffee Town. Was that your doing or did someone just do it as a nod to you or how, how did that work out? Yeah. It was 100% me. I was the <laughs> one of my closest friends in the world, Justin Adler, created that show. And uh, yeah, we just got to an episode where we needed a coffee store. I'm like, he's coffee town. He's like, well, I'm like, yeah, I'll get the rights, you know, whatever. It's just, I just call Ricky. Um, you know, the cool thing was we already had all the art, you know what I mean? It's like, it costs money to design that stuff. Um, and I'm like, I'll just get the JPEG of the coffee town emblem and we'll just print that up instead of having to come up with a new one. We'll save you a day. Um, but it was really sweet. So when we shot that scene, seeing Colin Hanks and everybody in the coffee town stuff was truly, because that was just a few years ago. It was like a little memory lane kind of thing. And I sent the picture to Howerton and all those guys. And they're like, ah, everyone, it was like, it's like, a, it's like the Lord of the Rings guys all getting their tattoos when they, you know, it's like, they look back at that time as like the time that forged them as people or whatever. It really does feel like coffee town was this moment in time that can't, exist again and will never be allowed to exist like no one will ever be allowed to do the things we did uh right. so yeah it was it's me but that was truly truly a nod to that and a few people caught it the coffee town it has a weird cult following a very good cult following but not as wide as you would think and uh so the people that did see it uh went wild and stuff but it was uh the other people were like, what are you talking about? What is Coffee Town? Did you have a favorite memory from the production, whether it was on screen, off screen with someone? I think we, we shot the, my favorite memory is we shot the uh, outside nighttime stuff at the very end. Um, and it was so cold because uh, we shot, this is in, uh, up in the high desert, we shot, shot this movie uh, in Palmdale. And it was truly like everyone was just punch drunk and weird and funny. And we had Matt Walsh there. We had the whole cast, plus Matt Walsh was playing a cop. Um, and that was like the greatest, weirdest ending of any movie. Like we were just out of it and having so much fun. People were doubling over laughter. There was, there was a scene where um, Glenn goes up the ladder on the side of a building to get to the roof where he, his feet stick in or whatever. So the stunt, not even this, we didn't have a stunt guy, but just like the props guy, he's like, I'm gonna show you how to go up this ladder. He starts going up the ladder and the ladder comes off the side of the building. <laughs> it's like going like this. And I'm like, thank God. Like he was okay and he fell, but he was okay. But I'm like, thank God that wasn't Glenn. Like, like if you hadn't <laughs> come up, like stuff. So all of that just became this crazy whirlwind. I also think the, uh, another highlight is the fight between Ponce, who the Down syndrome actor and uh, Chad, uh, Steve Little. And I told Ponce, Ponce was the sweetest, funniest, nicest guy uh i said and he's like what do i do i'm like just beat him up like just go for it <laughs> just jump all over him. we're gonna have three cameras running and so there's a scene where he like jumps and he just kind of belly flops on him ponce really does that like he really flattens steve little in a few spots and stuff and it was all all the cast was doing it uh like the cast was there they weren't you know only a few people were in that shot but and there you could tell the crew and everybody was standing around was like i can't believe we're doing this like we're really watching <laughs> A guy with Down syndrome <laughs> fight another guy, and he's really fighting him. And we're really filming this? Like, it was bizarre. It was bizarre. That that scene had one of the fanta most fantastic literal punchlines, too, and the cook comes out. It clocks I, think, I feel like down. that's why they came up he's with that part. Down, down syndrome. syndrome. <laughs> and we tried to get this, this song for that uh, uh, from Karate Kid. We tried yeah. to get uh, uh, you're the best or whatever. It's been used a lot. And we're like, ah, this joke has been everywhere i think even sunny in philadelphia used it um using that song as a punchline mm -hmm. but you so you have to clear that song with the guy that wrote it joe joe bean as es esposito, esposito. Mm -hmm. yeah so esposito's like yeah i clear i clear it all the time just give me the pages he's like i you know this is how i make my living i sell this one song to everybody so send me the pages and we didn't want to send him the pages because we're like he's not going to clear it like he's going to see what this is and they're like no no he always says yes he always says yes we send him the pages, phone rings the next day. No, he's not clearing this song. So the song you hear is a, is a copy. We got the publishing rights to it. It's not him singing. It's not the exact version from Coffee Down or from uh, Karate Kid. And that's why we couldn't get Joe to sign off on it. That's hilarious. That's, yeah, that is such a, 
Yeah, that is such a great scene. And, like, it's a jaw-dropping scene. You can't believe it's happening. Like, yeah, it's just fantastic. That's the trailer.